Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight for a public lecture by Dr. Wendy Suzuki called Practical Neuroscience for Everyday Life. <clears throat> My name is uh, Jim Hicks. I'm a faculty member here at UC Irvine. I'm the director of the initiative called the Exercise Medicine and Sports Science Initiative. And what I wanted to do at the very beginning of this, before we got into the lecture by Wendy, was just to take a few moments, just about three or four minutes, to tell you about what is an initiative, because an initiative doesn't really fit the definition of an institute or a center that you typically associate with a university. So what is this exercise medicine and sports science initiative? It was first started about three years ago, funded by the Office of the Provost, and it was really to bring together a community of scholars on the UC Irvine campus, all interested in physical activity in its various forms and how it might influence health and alter disease trajectories. And so we could ask, what is an initiative? It's organized around a common theme, which is, in this case, is exercise and physical activity. It works with and across existing departments and schools. It's, designed, it's one of our jobs is to try to come up with facilities and ideas for workspaces that will it really uh, support and incorporate multidisciplinary research. And of course, tonight's a great example of multidisciplinary research. Develop education and training programs that will foster these multidisciplinary approaches. Establish partnership arrangements with other academic institutions, which we're doing now, and with the private sector. And to obtain, of course, funding within and beyond government agencies. And so we have a very simple mission. Our mission really is to enhance human health and wellness through undergraduate and graduate teaching, postdoctoral training, basic and translational research, development of innovative technologies, service to the community, and to help promote clinical activities with the topic of physical activity and how it influences health and altered disease. And so you can see here very quickly that we, are, we have our initiative. We have affiliated faculty that associate with the initiative. We have developed an undergraduate major in integrative exercise science. We're developing an interdisciplinary graduate program, master's level, PhD. <clears throat> we, again, try to promote clinical activities associated with physical activity uh, uh, exercise. We've developed an elective course in the medical school cur curriculum for the training of some of our future physicians. We have affiliated schools and institutes and centers. We have faculty that affiliate with our in initiative from bio -sci, medicine, engineering, social sciences, and the Clara Trevor School of the Arts. And we do interact with UCI's intercollegiate athletic community outreach, which is one of the examples tonight, and social media presence, again, emphasizing education, basic science, and clinical science. And just a really short two-minute video that will demonstrate a little bit about our um, program. The Exercise Medicine Sports Science Initiative at UC Irvine is a community of scholars here at UCI that are interested in studying physical activity and how it influences human health and might influence disease. It's also involved in promoting clinical studies associated with exercise, as well as uh, in working with engineering, the development of innovative technologies associated with movement. Well, I think the initiative is filling a very important role in bringing us together and making everyone aware of the uh, multitude of projects that are going on on this campus focused on physical activity and health. Some new discoveries that are associated with the exercise science program here at UC Irvine include the study that's been highlighted with Dr. Hicks and understanding concussion. This project includes engineering students, it includes engineering faculty, it includes our sports department, our water polo team, and putting sensors on our players and understanding what actually happens to their heads during games. When you cross these different disciplines together, you can sometimes create a synergy that leads to innovations and new ideas that wouldn't happen otherwise. My research in particular focuses on looking at and understanding how we can improve the wellness of dancers and how can we embody and make their performance better by understanding those physiological needs. I always explain it as kind of yin and yang of how dance can help science and how science can help dance. Bringing in different disciplines from people from the arts, people from neuroscience, physiologists, that is a huge strength of this initiative. The long-term mission of the Exercise Medicine Sports Science Initiative is to really become the center of expertise for 
all things related to understanding physical activity and health. We really want to be center of excellence for that in not only the region, but in the country. So it's on that background that uh, the initiative is very pleased to be one of the co-sponsors tonight of this talk. And I want to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Yasa. Mike Yasa, who is the director of the Center for Neurobi Neurobiology of Learning and Memory. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all for being here. Um, it is a great pleasure and an honor to be able to partner with the EMSSI and with Dr. Hicks on uh, putting on what I think is going to be a fantastic evening for the community. And I just want to spend a couple of seconds uh, telling you a little bit about our center. Um, the Center for Neurobiology of Learning and Memory has been around uh, since 1983. So it was actually founded by um, someone who's with us here in the audience, Dr. Jim McGaw, uh, in 1983. And um, uh, Jim is... Jim was one of the founding faculty here at Irvine in 1964 and, and has really been um, at the center of all of the neuroscience work that we've had at Irvine for quite some time. Um, so this is the very first research institute in the world to be dedicated solely to the study of learning and memory mechanisms in the brain. And our focus is very much on collaboration and integration across levels. As you'll see in the, today's talk, we very much focus on being able to, to go all the way from cells and molecules all the way out to cognition. Uh, we have over fac 50 faculty fellows that are affiliated with the center, most at Irvine, but many also at other UCs and other institutions. And our research mission is really built on promoting the most innovative learning and memory research um, that is really addressing humanity's greatest challenges. And we have a lot of translational applications, as you can see here, and the work that has been done in the center has been used to fuel technology, benefit education, brain health, even things like law, economics, and society writ large. And now we have been uh, uh, really fortunate to be part of the Orange County community for uh, obviously for the last 50 years or so. And we have also been very, very fortunate to be able to share our findings with that community. And the CNLM has, has a track record in doing this. Uh, one of our most recent events, which I'm sure many of you have been able to attend, was a lecture series that was also started by Dr. McGaugh in 1995. This is the Distinguished Lecture in Brain Learning and Memory. And our last speaker was Dr. Ruth Benka. And as you can see, it was a packed house. Um, in fact, I think we violated the fire code that day, but we're not telling anybody. One of the other things that we feel very strongly about, in addition to educating the community, is also educating school children and being able to do lab tours, uh, both in our laboratories and also going out into the community and talking with, with students at their schools. And we also do a fair number of public talks in the community uh, to, to try to get the word out about the research that we do. So if you're interested in more information, of course, about the center, uh, it's a very easy web address, just memory.uci.edu. And I highly encourage all of you to check it out and see what kinds of resources are available. Um, so with that, I want to kind of um, use this as a, as a jumping off point to talk a little bit about our speaker today, um, Dr. Wendy Suzuki, who I've known um, for some time. And Wendy, I can't see her from here. Wendy um, has actually been a, a, a good friend for some time now. And she was affiliated with the center when she was doing her training, actually, in UCSD. Um, so it's only appropriate that we bring Wendy back to Irvine uh, to talk to us about her work and to also talk to us about a personal side of her work which has arised recently and really fueled this beautiful book that she has written. Um, so I'm going to give you uh, a little bit of background on Wendy just so you can kind of get where she's coming from. Um, Dr. Suzuki earned her PhD in neuroscience from UC San Diego in 1993 and she did a postdoctoral fellowship at the National Institutes of Health uh, before accepting a faculty position at NYU where she has remained ever since. Now her interests have started out in learning and memory mechanisms and brain plasticity in general. And over the last uh, few years, she has really diverted uh, her interests, but still maintained the interest in brain plasticity, but diverted a little bit more into trying to understand the impact of exercise on that kind of plasticity. And as you'll see, she has uh, kind of the, a beautiful mixture of basic and applied scientists. And you'll see this mixture very nicely today. Um, so I don't want to take up any more of her time. Um, let me just use this opportunity to welcome both Wendy and also uh, um, we're going to have a partner with Wendy today, uh, Ms. Tina Elkins, who's going to come up and join her on the drums. So please, let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you so much, both Jim and 
Mike, for uh, this amazing honor to come and speak here today. I'm a product of the University of California. I went to Berkeley as an undergraduate, yay. I went to UCSD as a graduate student, and my very first important talk that I gave as a young graduate student was right here at the Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory in the atrium when Dr. McGaw was leading that center, and I still remember that talk. I remember what I was wearing. <laughs> that talk went really well, which is part of the reason I'm here today. So what I'd like to do today is um, tell you about how my understanding of neuroscience ended up allowing me to change my brain. That change in my brain changed my life. And that change in my life ended up changing the way I did my science, why I did my science, and how I did my science. In other words, I want to tell you about how neuroscience can actually change your life. And that story really starts on the day that I realized I wanted to become a neuroscientist. And that happened to be the very first day of my freshman year at UC Berkeley. I was so lucky because I was able to take a freshman uh, seminar class with an amazing professor, Marion Diamond. Can you tell which one she is? Yeah. <laughs> so Marion, Marion is an amazing researcher, and I'll never forget that very first day. So I was a freshman. There were only about 15 people in that classroom. And she was standing in front of the classroom, owning, owning that classroom, and, but also in a very benevolent way. And uh, it was very uh, memorable because on the desk in front of her, she had a hat box. Remember, this, this class is called The Brain and Its Potential. She started telling us about why we should appreciate our brains, why it's so interesting. Why? Because the brain defines how we see the world, how we feel, feel the world around us, how we think, our sense of humor. And as she was telling us all, telling us all this, she slowly opened that hat box. And out of that hat box, she pulled a real preserved human brain, just like this one. So you can imagine all us freshmen were, were flabbergasted. Um, I will always remember how reverently she, hold, she held that brain. One of the things that's just amazing, every time I pick up a brain, and I, I uh, use human brains in my, in my talks and in my courses a lot, is its density. So dense. This is what's helping you see, feel, hear. And um, so much information is packed in here. So let me give you a quick tour. This is the frontal lobe up here, right behind my eyes. Uh, so if this was in my head, it would be right about here. My eyes would be sitting right here. Frontal lobe up here, very important for executive function, being able to tell how um, uh, uh, um, to order your day, for example. Also working memory up here, your ability to focus and shift attention dependent on this part of the brain. If I go to the back here, this is the occipital lobe. Primary visual cortex is back here. This is why you see. You can have eyes that work just fine, but if this area of your brain is damaged, you are blind. Um, the other key area is the temporal lobe down here. It used to be called the silent lobe because nobody knew what it did. We now know it's very important for higher visual function. And if I flip the brain over, just below this region right here is a key structure we'll be talking about called the hippocampus critical for long-term memory. But just imagine, we all have one of these in our brains, uh, in, our, in our brains, in our heads. Um, and, uh, uh, but you rarely get to see it. So, so tonight, tonight is a, is a uh, time that you can, you can see that. OK, so that was amazing. But uh, uh, again, we're still in the first day of my freshman year at UC Berkeley. Uh, I see the brain. And the thing that got me about uh, uh, that first day of class was not only the brain, to see the brain, the human brain for the first time, but what really got me was the studies that Marion Diamond told me about that she had done in the 1960s with this amazing group uh, of scientists, her colleagues at UC Berkeley, where they asked the simple question, can the adult brain change in response to the environment? 
Now remember, this was the early 1960s. At that time, nobody believed that once you got to the adulthood, there was any plasticity because they, nobody had seen it before. Well, Marion and her colleagues decided to address this question with a very elegant experiment. What she did is she raised a group of rats in what they called an enriched environment, shown here. Basically, it's the Disney world of rat cages. So they put rats in a big cage with lots of toys and lots of other rats to play with. And she, they let them live there for several months. And then she compared the brains of those rats with a, a group of rats that were raised in what they called impoverished environments. Just a small cage, couple of other rats, but no toys. What they found for the very first time is that the rats raised in those enriched environments, the outer covering of the brain, what you are seeing on the outside here, called the cortex, was actually thicker in the brains that were raised in Disney World. This was the very first example of brain change, uh, that is physical change of the brain in response to the environment. And that's what made me go, wow, that's cool. I want to study that. I want to understand how our brains can change. So um, uh, that, went, that, that set me on a, a, a trajectory to go to graduate school, go uh, and study my favorite form of brain plasticity, which turned out at that time to be memory. Memory is the most common form of brain change that, uh, that we experience every single day. Um, I've never met Tina before, but now I could associate Tina's name with Tina's face. That is a new long-term memory, and that means something has changed in my brain. Um, and so when we talk about long-term memory and things changing, we talk about, oh, before I did that, I wanted to uh, mention that uh, I, I mentioned, you know, I was so lucky to have Marion Diamond as, as my professor. She was a mentor, and she continues to be a mentor. I'm not her only fan. In fact, uh, they made a beautiful documentary about her called My Love Affair with the Brain, The Life and Science of Marion Diamond that's coming up on PBS. It's going to be shown uh, very recently on, May, on March 26th here in the Los Angeles and Southern California area. I highly recommend it. So uh, to give you a flavor for what a phenomenal instructor and mentor she is, um, there uh, um, uh, Google University goes around and videotapes um, professors, uh, uh, popular professors, giving lectures. She was in the top three downloads on Google University, over two million downloads of her courses. They estimated that over her 50-year career, she taught enough people to fill the um, uh, stadium at UC Berkeley. So um, she is a very beloved um, uh, teacher, and so I, I highly recommend that you, you go see this. But now I want to go back to the key structure that we know is important for long-term memory, and that is the hippocampus. We know that the hippocampus is very important for long-term memory because of uh, one neurological patient. We now know his name is Henry Mollison, and he was described by these two uh, women that I also consider my mentors. Professor Brenda Milner at the Montreal Neurological Institute and uh, the late Professor Suzanne Corkin, who was at MIT. What did they do? Uh, Brenda described the specific memory impairment that this patient had. Henry Mollison had very, very severe epilepsy. Epilepsy so severe that uh, um, uh, epileptic drugs would not cure it. The only uh, um, direction that they had, the only cure, was to go in and uh, remove one of his hippocampi. Because in the 1950s, when they did this, they knew that this was a useful um, uh, uh, um, uh, operation to help with epilepsy. His epilepsy was so severe, they decided to do an experimental process where they would take out not just one hippocampus, but both hippocampi, just to make sure that, that uh, the epilepsy was cured. Well, they did that, and the good news was his epilepsy got much less severe. The bad news was he woke up from that operation not being able to form any new long-term memories. He was 27. He was never able to form a new long-term memory, basically for the rest of his life. And Brenda Milner was the one that characterized that 
global memory impairment, that very, very severe mem memory impairment that he had. Um, and this was the story that, that inspired me and many, many other learning and memory researchers, probably many of you, uh, the neuroscientists in this room. How can that be? How could the hippocampus be allowing us to form those forms of memory and uh, to form new long-term memories for the rest of our lives? And um, I'll just say that if you want to learn more about uh, HM, um, that's how the patient, how this patient was referred to for many years while he was being studied by his um, initials, but now we know his name is Henry Mollison. If you want to learn about him, Professor Brenda Miller and Professor Su Suzanne Corkin, I'll just say that um, uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, I was asked by uh, the, um, the big podcast company, PRX, to do a series of podcasts um, on whatever I wanted. And of course, the first two podcasts I wanted to do was um, interviewing both Brenda Milner and Suzanne Corkin about their experiences with HM, and in particular, uh, the, um, uh, the podcast with, um, um, with Suzanne Corkin um, includes actual radio interview that she did with, with uh, patient HM, so you could actually hear what it's like. He was able to have a completely normal conversation with you, but um, he could not form any new long-term memory, so he would not be able to remember you after he went out of you know, immediate uh, uh, conversation. And um, what, is that, what is that like to live with that kind of impairment? It's, it's actually really, really fascinating. So I became fascinated with the hippocampus. So hippocampus means seahorse. And so I showed you my favorite picture. This is a, a dissected hippocampus from a human hippocampus, and you can see why it was uh, uh, called a seahorse. And um, what I wanted to do when I uh, started my new lab at New York University was study exactly how the electrical activity in the hippocampus allowed us to form new long-term memories. Something about my hippocampus and how it's firing allowed me to remember Tina's name. I don't know, I didn't, we don't know what it was, and that's what I wanted to explore. So in 1998, I got to NYU, starting my own lab, looking at the physiological functions of the hippocampus to form, to study my favorite form of long-term memory, okay? And this picture I love to show, because this is the atmosphere that it was like to be in my lab uh, for those first few years. It was like a dinner party you never wanted to leave because there were so many interesting questions, so many interesting people to talk about, so much fun. The first, you know, when you're starting a new lab, uh, uh, getting new people and, and building this team, this was the atmosphere. Now, those first six years at a university are also challenging. So while this was the atmosphere in the lab, when I think back on that time and think about the social life that I had, this is the picture that comes up. So, so I, I spent a lot of time in the lab. You know, I, I literally went from my apartment to my lab. I got takeout. I live in New York City. Went back to my apartment to eat the takeout. Gained 25 pounds. Um, had no friends outside the lab. Uh, you know, great relationships in the lab, but not outside the lab. And so I got to the point, uh, I had just gotten tenure. Um, I needed to do something. 25 pounds overweight. Um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to make new friends, but I didn't know how to lose weight, so I went to the gym. Oops. Uh, I went to the gym, and um, this was the first kind of life changer that exercise kind of brought into my life. Um, what happened was immediate mood boost when I, when I started going to uh, the gym regularly. And the secret for me, and hopefully it could be the secret for you, is that I found a class that really engaged me. This class at the gym um, combined physical movements from kickbox and dance and yoga and martial arts and combined it with positive spoken affirmations. So in class you had to yell out these positive spoken affirmations with a whole bunch of other sweaty affirmation yelling people. And I have to tell you, the first time I went to that class, I felt ridiculous. Like, I, I didn't want to do it, but, but I did it a little bit. So in this class, just to give it a little flavor, instead of just punching back and forth like you would do in kickbox class, you would actually pair it with an affirmation. So Tina's going to help me. Five, six, seven, eight. It's right, left, right, left. And we say, I am strong now, or I believe I will succeed. Done. Thank you. Okay, so that, that's, um, just to give you a 
flavor. So I would go to this class. I got addicted to this class, and I would come out of class, and I remember myself saying to myself, I can't wait to get to the next class. You know, I came out of class all sweaty, feeling really good, mood going through the roof. And uh, so energy, mood, lost the weight. It was, it was great. Um, um, and I made new friends at the gym because finally I was getting out of the lab. So, so big kind of personal paradigm shift uh, happened with, with the simple act of going to the gym. Now, the next thing that I noticed was even more striking. This happened after a year, year and a half of regular gym going, regular uh, classes. This, this uh, workout is called Intensati, um, regular classes of Intensati. And this thing, this change that I noticed, happened at work. I remember I was working, this was again, year and a half in, and I was doing something that I always do. I was writing a grant. And there was this thought that came through my mind that never, ever had come through my mind. The thought was, gee, grant writing is going well today. I, I'd never had this thought, thought before. And I, I linked it to, I thought, well, me, I, I formed a hypothesis. My, my hypothesis was, gee, I wonder whether the um, better grant writing has to do with my increased exercise. Because specifically, I noticed that I could focus my attention better and longer, and that my memory, my long-term memory, was better. So this sent me back to the literature. And what I found was increased aerobic exercise increases a range of different neurotransmitters that we know are associated with higher mood states. What are those neurotransmitters? A single bout of aerobic exercise increases your serotonin levels, your dopamine levels, your noradrenaline levels, and your endorphin levels, okay? So clearly, that's part of what was going on. What about attention and mood? Well, it turns out one of the things that we learned in this wonderful symposium that, that preceded this talk is one of the most common findings in studies looking at the effect of increased exercise in people is improved ability to shift and focus your attention. So I thought, check, that's happening with me. What about long-term memory? What do we know about that? So I started going through the literature trying to figure out what's going on, and I found a face that was very familiar. That face was Marion Diamond. Because you remember all those studies uh, where she, um, she raised rats in enriched environments to ask, um, what is that doing for their, for, for their brain? Um, so she asked, what, what would happen if you enriched the environment? She found all of these different changes. I talked about, I mentioned uh, the outer covering. Here's a very thin section through a rat brain. The outer covering got thicker. Here's just lines showing you how thick the outer covering is. It gets thicker when you raise rats in enriched environments. Neurotransmitter levels increase. There are more synapses, which is the way that neurons communicate with each other. More angiogenesis, that is, more blood vessels in the brain. More growth factors. And more what's called hippocampal neurogenesis. That means that enriched environments actually stimulate the birth of brand new neurons in the hippocampus. That's amazing, in adult hippocampi. Okay, so this is everything that we know from Marion Diamond studies and later studies on the effects of enriched environments. Well, one of our speakers today, Henriette von Prague, asked the question, the critical question, what parts of this enriched environment, here's a schematic enriched environment, what parts are really important? Is it the social aspect? Is it the games? Um, my favorite sub uh, control experiment is uh, they had a group of rats just watching other rats play to see if that helped. It didn't help, okay? What, what did help? The single factor that improved, that made all those brain changes was giving rats a running wheel. All you had to do was give rats that running wheel, and you saw all of these changes, so I'm gonna change this to exercise, changes all of these brain structures in, uh, uh, in all of these areas. So I thought, aha! That's what's happening to my brain. I'm just like a rat in Disney World, getting more uh, thicker cortex, and my hippocampus is improving. Well, this was um, this is all part of kind of the personal changes that I was that I was observing. Lost a lot of weight, got uh, more social engagement. Um, my mood was better. My attention was better. My memory was better. But all of these kind of personal changes 
quickly and easily kind of rolled over into my science life because I wanted to learn more about this literature. And anybody who is a professor of undergraduates knows that the best way to learn a topic is to teach a new class on it. So you have to develop this new class. So I decided to develop a new class called Can Exercise Change Your Brain? And I was gonna go over all of the findings that I just told you about in, in animals and all of the clinical findings. But this class was inspired by me going to the gym. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun if I could actually bring exercise into the classroom and get the students to exercise and then tell them about what exercise was doing to their brains. So I went to the administration and I said, guys, I have a great idea. All you have to do is give me some money to pay an exercise instructor uh, to come in and then I'll teach about the class and, and then we'll, you know, this will be a really innovative new class. And they said, that is a great idea, but we pay you to teach the classes. So no, no extra money for, um, for an exercise instructor. So I went back to my office and, and sat there and I thought, okay, well, if they're not gonna pay for an exercise instructor, I'll do the next most obvious thing. I'll go to the gym and get certified to teach the exercise class myself, uh, which is exactly what I did. And of course, I decided to teach this class in Tensati because that was the class that I was going to. So this started the most elaborate course preparation that I've ever had in my entire career. Because I was a student in this class, and I was, you know, I can be a good student, but um, I, I did a whole week of teacher training, and then I did six months of just practicing how to teach this class in front of uh, students, because these were gonna be kind of uh, uh, very, very um, uh, judgmental NYU students, so I wanted to do a good job. <laughs> and so um, I literally, I invited all my friends to come te take three classes with me. I would teach one person. Um, I went and practiced at home for my cat. Um, uh, my cat does intensati great. Um, and of course, at the same time during the six months, I'm preparing the academic part of the class and getting more and more fascinated with what we know about the effects of exercise on brain function. So six months of, of serious preparation, you know, multiple intensati practice sessions every week, uh, preparing the academic. And finally, I get to the day. September 7th, 2009, the first day of fall semester. And I walk into the same classroom that I've been lecturing in more traditionally for the previous 15 years. Three things are very different that day. Thing number one, I'm clad head to toe in spandex. Because I, I'm teaching an exercise class, I usually don't come to, to class in spandex, uh, but that day I did. Second thing that was different, I was really nervous. I, I don't get nervous giving lectures. You know, I had uh, lots of teaching experience under my belt by that time, but that day I was very, very nervous because I wanted the students to like this class as much as I liked the class. So um, that was number two. Number three um, was the students themselves. So you know, the first day of fall semester with a new instructor, everybody's a little excited, don't know what's going on. These students look scared. They looked terrified. I think it was me and my spandex. They did not, they knew they had to exercise, right? But they just didn't know whether they wanted to exercise with me. Um, but there was only one way to figure out whether this was going to work. And uh, what I want to do is bring you back to that day in a very, very real way. So I'm going to ask you all to stand up. Okay. So. With Tina's help, we're gonna do just three minutes of intensati. All you have to do is do what I do, say what I say. Five, six, seven, eight. Punches right and left. Go right, left, right, left. And I say, I am really strong. You say it. I am really strong. Ladies, I Right, left, right, left. I am inspired. 
back on college, okay? Imagine what it would have been like if you can do that for an hour with your professor before every class, okay? Because that's what we did. Here's what I did in this classroom. So it's a combination. Every class consisted of one hour of intense ati that I did with the students in the classroom, followed by an hour and a half lecture discussion that I led. I thought I was going to be dead by the end of the day. <laughs> Turns out the exercise inspired my energy, and I was fine. I felt great by the end of the day. In fact, I have to say that this class changed the way that I taught every other class at NYU since. Why? Because bringing exercise, bringing movement, bringing these positive affirmations into the classroom completely transformed that relationship. Was that a little bit different than just sitting here listening to a, a dry lecture from somebody just talking? Um, yes, it's a little bit different. And I can tell you that that energy and playful enthusiasm that we generated doing the exercise together completely kind of rolled over into the academic part of the class. And what does that look like? That looked like easier uh, discussions, um, more creativity in the um, uh, papers that I had the students do. It really set my own personal bar for how I want to engage the students in a very different way. But there was also something very important that this class did. Early on in the development of this class, I realized that these students were going to be my first exercise experiment because they were going to be exercising, increasing their exercise for the entire semester. So I collaborated with some colleagues at Columbia University uh, to test them cognitively on a series of tests uh, that test the function of the hippocampus. So we tested them at the beginning, at the end of the semester, and then I needed a control group, a different class that didn't exercise. So I went to my colleague, one of my colleagues, and I said, hey, are you exercising in class? And they, they said no. And I said, can I, can, I, um, uh, can, can I test your students at the beginning, at the end of the semester? And they said yes. So, um, so I had my control class. So we had a great semester, uh, changed the way I taught. But what happened? Did they actually get better? Did their brains improve in the way that I was seeing my own brain improve? What we found, and first I have to say, that this was just once a week increased exercise. These are healthy, um, um, uh, well, uh, um, healthy NYU students. And um, what we found is that my NYU, my class that exercised, actually got significantly faster. Their reaction times got better in answering memory questions relative to the class that didn't exercise, okay? So it wasn't that their memory got better, but they didn't exercise all that much. So all that did was fire and stoke my, my interest. I kept thinking, what if I could get uh, um, the students to exercise two or three times a week? What would that do? So um, that was a, a really, really important kind of shift in my own uh, science development. Uh, this started what started out to be kind of a science hobby, looking at the effects of aerobic exercise on brain function, but has now switched to uh, um, the only thing that my lab does. So all the memory work that I did, I did it for 17 years, 17, 18 years, but that has wound down. And my entire lab has focused on understanding how exercise can change your brain. Now, I, I just want to step back and unpack that a little bit because um, it's not that easy uh, for a full professor who has her, her experience in one area to suddenly say, oh, I'll, I'll just do something else. That's, that's not what you typically do. Why did, that, why did that happen? One, it was so obvious in my own personal experience how much exercise had changed my brain, my memory, my mood, my attention, very much changed. But I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that there was another thing that happened in my life that also shifted me towards the desire to want to understand and get the answer to these questions. Because at the same time, literally at the same time, that I was noticing how much my own brain was improving with exercise, my father developed very sudden and quite severe dementia. What do I mean by that? He, uh, he came home one day uh, from his usual drive to get his coffee at the 7-Eleven that he'd been driving to for the last 30 years, 
telling my mom he couldn't remember how to get to 7-Eleven anymore. That's very serious. So I got him the best um, neurologist that I could uh, find him at Stanford University. They're, they're in Sunnyvale, California. And all I can think was, if he, he's 85, he can't, he can't do intense Lassie with me. Um, but uh, all I can think was, what if I could help people before they get to that stage? What if I could help strengthen their brain, improve their prefrontal function, um, uh, increase neurogenesis in the hippocampus, which are probably the two key brain areas that are uh, um, having problems in my dad? How many more months or even years might that get him? So all of this coming together said, yes, I want to try and understand this question, uh, to move from kind of basic questions, which are fascinating and interesting, to a question that might be able to help somebody today, tomorrow, or even next week. So what do we want to do? We want to understand the exercise prescription. How much, how long, what kind of exercise is best? We also want to understand those um, neurochemical pathways that are critical for our ability, for the ability of movement out in our body, all this exercise that we're doing, to actually change the brain. Now, I want to add one more aspect to this, and that has to do with uh, another very fascinating function <clears throat> of the hippocampus. So we've been talking about the hippocampus in long-term memory. Ever since uh, patient HM, we've known <clears throat> that the hippocampus is critical for long-term memory. But more recently, um, a really exciting new um, idea has developed. That idea is that the hippocampus may not only be important for memory, but might be important for the ability to imagine things that you've never experienced before. Imagination, <clears throat> a critical component of creativity. How did we figure this out? Well, <clears throat> people studying um, patients with damage to the hippocampus, not surprising these patients had memory deficits. These patients also seem to have an unusual inability to imagine a situation that they'd never experienced before. These were people living in London. They had been to the beach, but never a tropical beach. And they were asked, can you imagine a tropical beach? Just give me, give me your best description of a tropical beach. And compared to age and language match controls, they had a very, very difficult time doing this. Not only these studies suggest that the hippocampus may also be important for being able to um, uh, put information together in novel ways that you've never experienced before, but other imaging studies. You can put people in a functional imaging magnet and ask them to imagine uh, uh, future situations that they've never experienced before. You also get activation of the hippocampus. So this suggests um, that increased exercise which is stimulating brand new neurons in the hippocampus, making the hippocampus work better, may not only be important for um, uh, long-term memory, but may also be important for imagination, a key component of creativity. OK, <clears throat> so what I want to do is um, I'm going to jump to um, the last experiment <clears throat> that I want to tell you about is uh, one that we're doing right now in New York. So one of the big questions we want to ask is, uh, again, getting to this exercise prescription. How much, how, what kind, how long exercise is important? And we want to study this in healthy young adults because they can really increase their exercise and we can see kind of the, the maximum amount of cognitive benefit we can get. And so we are collaborating with a, a wonderful indoor cycling studio called Swerve to be able to do these studies. And Swerve is quite unique. So you have to have a gimmick to do these, uh, 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 to be successful. Their gimmick is every one of those bikes is hooked up to a caloric estimator. So based on your weight and how fast you're cycling, you, you can estimate exactly how many calories you're burning. And what they do is you go in to take class and you either uh, uh, cycle for the red team, the green team, or the blue team. And what they do is they average all the caloric outputs for everybody on the red team, green team, blue team, and they throw it up on the board, and the teacher says, come on, blue team, you're, you're losing. You better cycle better. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a great way to uh, motivate people. So we have a bunch of uh, people uh, uh, 
these are low fit people going three times a week um, to these, these uh, very energetic swerve classes and we're uh, testing their cognition um, at the beginning and the end of the three month period. Now we need a control group and we wanted to capture this kind of um, uh, competitive, friendly competitive aspect. So our control group is competitive video game playing. So they come into our lab and they play very vigorously against our undergraduates. And uh, we test them cognitively before and after <clears throat> three times a week for 12 weeks. And what are we seeing? We are seeing significant improvements in cardiorespiratory function in the people that work out, but not that play the video game. Uh, we are seeing significant improvements in mood. Uh, this is a very common theme. Uh, that you can see uh, uh, clear improvements in mood. And we're seeing improvements in hippocampal memory function uh, uh, um, with, with these tasks. So we still have a long way to go, but these are the kinds of questions that we want to, want to address. And um, we're, we're um, starting to be able to do that, um, first with the elderly population, but uh, sorry, with the uh, young population here, these, uh, these people are between um, 35 and 59 years old. Um, but there are other things to take, uh, take into consideration. What is your genetic background? Um, are you male or are you female? What, how are all of these things contributing to uh, your response to exercise? And these are some of the questions that we want to ask. Okay, so um, I want to end with um, giving you a set of implications for this work, which is really why I, I spend all this time and energy doing it. I think all the work that I've told you about uh, really boil down to the idea that um, the effects of exercise on the brain are important because they are showing us how to live and how to learn better with exercise. And the first implication that I want to emphasize, because I told you about this class that I do, are the implications for education. I want to know how we can implement exercise in the classroom to enhance the education experience. And as I'm thinking about this, pro, uh, this, this question, I looked around my, my lab at NYU for one of um, the resources. You, as a scientist, you, you want to take advantage of all the resources that you have. What I realized is I have a huge resource. This is Yankee Stadium. It's the, it's the only venue in New York City that is big enough for the NYU graduation with all the students and the parents. We have a lot of NYU undergraduates and graduate students. It's the largest private university in the country. So uh, inspired by this, we decided to do a pilot uh, study with a, a, a bunch of about 40 freshmen starting with a one semester on, one semester off exercise program to see whether we can see cognitive benefits in this population. And we're about two thirds of the way through the study, but we already have evidence that this increases their cardiorespiratory function. What we got was free, um, uh, free uh, um, gym memberships from the New York Health and Racquet Club for all the students that were, that were doing it. They, they did all their classes there. They definitely changed their cardiorespiratory function. They improved their frontal lobe function, um, their ability to shift and focus attention, and also improve their mood. So we're already seeing these benefits. And some of the uh, analyses that we haven't finished analyzing yet have to do with their engagement with their classes, their homework, their school uh, engagement. And so, so these are some of the questions that we want to uh, address. And um, so that's kind of day-to-day -day kinds of questions. But the longer term question that we're interested in is policy. Can, this, can these experiments actually help us shift education policy so that education comes back into the classroom instead of being shut out? Are my two exercise uh, PE instructors in this room? 
There they are. Okay, so we have uh, two PE instructors here that are fighting hard in, in the Irvine area to get exercise into their classrooms. And so this is the kind of research that eventually I would love to be able to share with you guys uh, so that you can go to the Department of Education and say, this is why we can't do an online exercise class. We must do that. They told me, they, they told me that their, their proposal to them is let's do online exercise, whatever that means. No, we can't do that. Okay, so that's education. Uh, the second implication is for healthy adults, and this starts with my own experience. Um, um, this improved my memory, my mood, my attention. We're starting to gather actual scientific evidence to support this idea. What would it mean if everybody in the country increased their exercise enough so that they were happier, they had better memory, and better attention? Do we think that would affect the gross natural, national product? I think it would, or productivity. So that's a really uh, exciting implication. And lastly, I think all of this is uh, heading toward uh, the idea that the earlier we get regular uh, physical education into our um, daily life, through education, through uh, um, this, this activities as adulthood, the longer our healthy brains are going to last. And so that's, that's a long-term goal. Okay, so take home messages. The title of my talk was Practical Neuroscience for Everyday Life. I've tried to give you an example, multiple examples, of how bringing physical activity into my life changed personal aspects, professional aspects. Heck, it changed my whole research direction. So I have three take homes for you. One, physical exercise causes positive changes in our brains that result in improved mood, memory, and attention. This is what's gonna happen when you start exercising. Two, you don't need to be a triathlete to get these benefits, okay? So part of uh, one of the wonderful messages from today's symposium is that even walking, actually walking, can improve mood. And walking can cause some of these brain improvements too in the older population. Uh, when you're younger, you probably need to uh, up your uh, uh, cardiorespiratory function to, to get, get, get those benefits. But we're starting to understand what those, um, what those benefits are. And that's to say, the most common question I get asked is, you know, Wendy, you talk all about this. Just tell me how much exercise I need. Just, just tell me, tell me the number, right? And then they say, oh, wait, wait, tell me the minimum number. I, I, I don't want to know the maximum. Tell me the minimum. And um, so, uh, uh, you know, we were talking about this today, and, and it's, uh, um, I like to say that it, it's, it really, it's what makes sense. You need to work harder. You need to work your heart harder so that you are sweating, you are working. If it's too easy, it's not working. If it's way too hard and stressful, it's not working. So for most of us in the middle ranges of fitness, it's gonna be something like three times a week of a good sweaty workout that will get you, get you these benefits. But the good news is in older people, a lot of evidence showed that even walking, increasing your walking alone can get you both the mood and the cognitive benefits. So uh, all of us at the symposium today, we're working towards these, uh, um, these final numbers to give you, but, but we need a little bit more time. And the last take home message is, when should I start? How much exercise should I do? The best time is to start right now. So I'm gonna ask you all to stand up one more time so that you remember everything in my talk. We're just gonna do this series one more time. Five, six, seven, eight. Right, left, right, left. And I say, I am strong now. You 